Hello there, my name is Gary Sims for Authority Media. Today I'm going to be talking to John Poole from Primate Labs. That's the people that bring us Geekbench. Hello, John. Nice to speak to you this evening or this morning, wherever it is that you are. Yeah, uh, it's afternoon here in Toronto. Uh, good to meet you and uh, good to speak with you. Now, benchmarking can be quite a controversial uh, topic, and I'd like to talk about that uh, with you today. But before we dive into that, please do tell us a little bit about yourself and about Geekbench. Sure. So uh, Geekbench, uh, it's a product that we make here at Primate Labs. I'm the founder. Uh, I'm also sort of the the uh, the spokesperson, if you will, for the company. Uh, so I get to do all these sort of fun interviews like this and talk about Geekbench. Uh, so that's that's my role here at Primate Labs. So as the founder of uh, Geekbench, uh, how, how did you come up with the idea? What happened? What was the itch that you needed to scratch? Yeah. So it was actually back around 2003. Um, I went out and uh, I just switched over to Mac uh, from PC. Uh, maybe about a year before, you know, I had a G4 system. Apple came out with a G5. It was very exciting, you know, the first 64-bit personal computer and all of that. And I went out and I bought one uh, and got it home and started running, you know, the sort of tests I use, uh, you know, developer stuff, uh, you know, my usual sort of things that I do on my computer. And it didn't feel that much faster. Uh, so I was a little bit confused. Uh, so I went and, you know, uh, downloaded some of the popular Mac benchmarks at the time just to see sort of, you know, is this a problem with my system? Uh, you know, what's going on? Just trying to figure out what was happening. And the benchmarks were saying things like, oh, no, the G5 is faster. It's your, your G5 is working properly. Like, you know, it's on par with all the other G5s out there. Um, and I thought, well, this is really strange. So I went in and I reverse engineered one of the one of the popular benchmarks at the time. And found that the tests were very, very small and synthetic. They're sort of doing, you know, incredibly simplistic tasks that really, you know, uh, weren't good measures of performance. Like they were so small and so trivial that, you know, uh, really just depended on how fast your uh, processor ran uh, and nothing else didn't take into account memory or caches or anything like that. So I thought, you know, oh, how hard can it be? I'll write some of my own tests and we'll see what happens. And this was a side project I kind of worked on on and off for about three years until about, you know, early 2006. Uh, the first version was sort of ready to release. You know, I went and gathered some data uh, about, you know, how different processors performed. You know, it was available on uh, Mac because that's obviously what sort of kicked this off with the G5. But I also still had a PC around for gaming and whatnot. So, you know, I thought, oh, it would be interesting to do these cross-platform comparisons. And though it, so in 2006, released the first version of Geekbench sort of as, you know, this free download that people could use. You know, we published a couple of articles just saying, oh, like, you know, here's some charts and whatnot, some graphs showing, you know, P4 performance versus G5 versus G4 performance. Um, and very quickly, we landed on the front page of, and I will date myself here, Dig. Uh, you know, lots of traffic, lots of comments, you know, some people just tearing our methodology to shreds saying you're doing benchmarking wrong. Here's how you do it right. Which, you know, was humbling because I came into this not knowing what I was doing. Um, so got a lot of very great feedback very early on, a lot of it positive, a lot of it constructive. Um, a lot of people were clearly interested in that. And that side project just sort of grew into, you know, the business that it is today where, you know, we're providing benchmarks for millions of users each month and, uh, you know, kind of sort of, you know, for cross-platform comparisons, we're sort of the go-to benchmark now. And how big is the company now? It's not just you. There's obviously, there's more going on now. Absolutely. You know, we've got a small team here. Mostly, uh, most of us are located in Toronto. All of us are located on Ontario. Um, you know, we're, we're sort of kind of remote, especially after the pandemic. Um, but, you know, we've, we've got a very, you know, a, a small but mighty team here that works on the benchmark. Um, you know, a variety of different roles from, you know, people who work on the benchmark itself to folks who work on the AI workloads that we're working on. Um, you know, we've got people who work on data science, uh, sort of, you know, analyzing the results, making sure that we've got good statistical rigor. Uh, and then, you, you know, you still have me, who's the pretty face of the company. <laughs> now, you said those initial benchmarks that you're using were small and synthetic, and they weren't really giving you uh, accurate results. Now, I noticed that uh, Geekbench uses lots and lots of different algorithms because I'm, it's important to be able to simulate real-life workloads. Do you want to tell us a bit about the different workloads that Geekbench runs? Yeah, sure. So uh, in Geekbench 6, we've got uh, 15 uh, separate workloads that we use to measure CPU performance. Um, and we've tried to pick a variety of different tasks that reflect, we think at least, what people use their computers for day in, day out, or what they use their smartphones for day in or day out. Um, you know, obviously, you know, when you start talking about benchmarking, there's a lot of activity of benchmarking in other areas, servers, um, high performance computing, HPC, we try to avoid those workloads. Um, you know, it's, uh, so we really try and narrow into what people are actually going to do with their computers. Um, so it's a lot of, you know, things like, 
um you know compression is important because you know uh doing things like you know downloading apps on your smartphone you know uh android will unpack them so that you know uh you know they take less uh, data in transit um other things like um you know we've got html tests in there because you know people spend so much time in their web browsers today that's an important uh, metric to capture other things that came out of the pandemic um things like video conferencing you know we have a background blur workload because sort of doing that zoom effect of where your face is visible but your background's not, you know, if you've got, you know, a messy, you know, if you're working from home and you're working out of your bedroom or something like that, you know, you don't necessarily want people to see. Uh, and that suddenly become a, a new workload that, you know, wasn't even relevant three, four years ago. It's just sort of something that just came out of, you know, the the uh, the pandemic that happened. So we try and look at sort of, you know, what's going to be interesting to users, what's actually CPU intensive, uh, what's actually going to matter for their device day in, day out, because we want to make sure that we're not running small little simple tests where, you know, it's one or two tight loops or something, you know, that sort of performance can be really important in some areas. Uh, but, you know, uh, when it comes to sort of using your device day in, day out, it's going to be those larger tasks, the sort of things where, you know, maybe it's not one small little function, but it's a bunch of those little functions stitched together into a large workload, a large pipeline of things. You might see, you know, image editing being a perfect example of that, you know, if you're doing uh, tweaking something in photo. Photoshop, you're not just applying one filter to something, you're doing a bunch of operations, like you're doing some compression to uncompress the image, apply all the filters, recompress the image. So it's those sorts of pipelines, those sorts of workloads that we're sort of trying to move towards with each new version of Geekbench, you know, bring in bigger, more ambitious code bases, bring in bigger, more ambitious data sets. That's sort of the goal that we're doing, because we really don't want Geekbench to exist in a vacuum. We just don't want it to be a benchmark that says, oh, this new processor is better, this new processor is worse. Uh, we want it to be representative of what people actually do. So when people turn to Geekbench, they look at our charts, they look at the articles that are written using our benchmark, they're actually able to make good decisions about, is it time to upgrade? Is my device working properly? Uh, those sorts of questions. Because um, if we were just a benchmark that spit out, you know, oh, you know, this is this is 10 times, you know, 10% faster when it's really not going to be for any of their workloads, that's not a useful thing for us to be doing. You raise an interesting point there because nowadays CPUs have hardware acceleration, they have their own special instructions. So for an XAC, you've got SSC and you've got AVX on ARM, you'll have Neon and the new ARM V9 SVE. And then, of course, on top of that, you've got things like the Mac Silicon, you know, the Apple Silicon Max will use, you know, hardware acceleration for video uh, encode, for example. So how do you navigate that world? How do you navigate that path? So um, we don't have any video encoding specific workloads, at least not in six. It's something that we'd love to do. Patents make that incredibly difficult. So okay. we haven't touched that uh, yet, at least. It is something definitely that we're interested in doing. Uh, so that allows us to very neatly sidestep the issue of the sort of media blocks, uh, you know, encoders, decoders that they have. But when it comes to things like the instruction sets you mentioned, you know, um, Intel has SSE and AVX, ARM has Neon and now SVE. Um, what we try and do is when we look at a workload, if we're looking at something like image processing, we try and figure out, does it make sense to use these instruction sets? Like, are is this what an application is actually going to use? So for something like, you know, say um, the Instagram style filters I was talking about, you know, we have a workload in there uh, in Geek Bench 6 that makes use of Neon uh, and will make use of SVE. We didn't quite get it in for 6.0, but we'll get it in for 6.1, um, you know, that uses uh, the ARM special instruction sets for those. Uh, you know, it uses SSE and AVX on Intel ch uh, chips um, uh, as well. You know, we've kind of stayed away from necessarily jumping in with both feet with something like, say, more complicated like AVX 512 because we don't feel that it's really something that a lot of applications are using in the consumer space right now. Um, but for things like AVX2 acceleration, SSE acceleration, absolutely, we'll use those in the workloads where we think it's appropriate. Uh, when it comes to other things, sort of like, you know, GPU offload, we do have a separate benchmark in Geekbench, the GPU compute benchmark, which is sort of meant to capture that sort of heterogeneous compute that you might see in some applications where some of it runs on the CPU, some of it runs on the GPU. Um, but that's sort of our policy when it comes to sort of, you know, how do we leverage the acceleration, the new features, whether it's hardware instructions, whether it's dedicated IP blocks um, that are appearing now more and more in uh, processors is sort of that, you know, general processor performance that year over year increase is starting to decrease and companies are just having to become more creative in how they can make, uh, you know, the newer version of something faster and uh, more usable. I did get quite a few comments on my YouTube videos where I featured Geekbench when uh, a device doesn't win and someone wanted it to win. They say, oh, that's because Geekbench is better optimized for, for the other device. That's not true, is it? You optimize equally for, for everything, don't you? Absolutely. We spend a lot of time, we work with hardware companies as well. Uh, so the hardware companies that, you know, maybe are the ones who authored or implement the uh, inst uh, instruction set that we're using, we work with them as well to make sure that what we've got is 
um, not necessarily the very, very best that it can be, but that it's a fair and representative sampling of what that instruction set usage might be. Uh, and uh, we try and do that with all the various instruction sets that we support. So whether it's on the ARM side, whether it's on the uh, x86 side, uh, we try and make sure one that, you know, if it's something that we've written that, you know, it's uh, it, it's fair, it's reasonable, that it, it works well across all, because we really don't want to be in a position where we're writing, um, you know, let's say, uh, as an example, let's say we've gone and we've written a neon version of an uh, of a function, we don't want to necessarily take that neon version and try and graft it onto an SSE version, you know, sort of write SSE in the way of neon, we try and write things in a way that's natural for the instruction set that leverages the advantages, uh, and is mindful of the disadvantages of that instruction set so that we get something that should be comparable uh, across both platforms of both across both instruction sets. And it definitely is uh, it is a tricky job. We do definitely, we have a lot of our development processes sort of dedicated around making sure that these sort of differences, if they creep up, we can catch them and sort of see, you know, uh, we, you know, we're constantly comparing. We have a lab here of, you know, over 150 different test devices. Uh, we've had one hardware company refer to our lab as the hardware computing museum, because we've got things that go all the way back, uh, from on the PC side, you know, a core two duo all the way up to Raptor Lake systems. Uh, so, you know, we try and capture the whole breadth of things so that we, we were constantly looking to see, you know, okay, well, this only supports SSE. Is our SSE version working well? Okay, this only supports, you know, we've got IV Bridge or something like that. It only supports AVX. Is our AVX version working well? Okay, what about AVX2? So we're constantly doing that testing to make sure that, you know, in the development process, we haven't missed anything, that the results make sense, that they seem sensible, and that we haven't introduced any of that sort of bias that might come, especially once we start getting to the point of, you know, when we're handwriting, uh, AVX2 code or uh, neon code, you know, that sort of you know in, uh, unconscious bias that on you know that you know, one one code path might better be suited for an architecture than another. We really try and avoid that, and we really dedicate a lot of time to making sure that doesn't happen. Now you mentioned AI there and machine learning. Now, of course, with things like Chat GPT always being in the news at the moment, uh, machine learning inference, how our devices can handle machine learning workloads is going to become more and more important. Now you said you do some AI ML uh, benchmarking. Do you want to tell me a bit more about that? Sure. So we are actually taking two different approaches to how we want to measure ML performance. You know, we are including uh, ML benchmarks in. We had an ML benchmark in Geekbench Five. Uh, we have an M we have some new ML benchmarks in Geekbench 6, as I sort of alluded to. We now have a background blur uh workload that sort of mimics uh what Zoom's doing, where you know the the initial pass of that, obviously the blur that's happening in the background, that's a fairly traditional blur function. But just segmenting the image into sort of this part of the image is the foreground, don't blur it, this part is the background, do blur it. Um, that's you know a fairly I, I want to say traditional, but you know, traditional in the sense that 2018 is traditional for ML, um, a fairly well known and understood, you know, method for doing that uh, we have a couple of other workloads you know we have a photo library workload as well in geekbench 6 that sort of you know uh, works through some of the steps that you might have when you're importing photos into your library where uh, a lot of photo applications, you know, Google Photos, Apple Photos will use ML to sort of semantically tag your images. So, you know, if you're like me and you've got small children, you've uploaded, you know, 100 baby pictures a day, uh, it'll go through and it'll tag things and say, oh, baby, 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 cat, baby, that sort of thing. So, you know, if you're going back and you can search through your photos, uh, it makes it a lot easier to go through. So that's some of the ML stuff that we're trying to capture. Um, we also have a separate benchmark that we've been doing, uh, released it back around 2021, uh, sort of a, a limited preview kind of thing, because you know, it's very much a work in progress where we're uh, looking at the performance of ML across a huge variety of workloads where we're sort of taking, um, you know, again, sort of the traditional, again, you know, saying 2018 is traditional in ML. Um, uh, models and applications, image recognition, object detection, face detection, uh, you know, doing some things with uh, language models as well, doing uh, on-device translation, um, on-device uh, semantic analysis of text, and running those on not just the CPU, but also the NPUs if they're available and the GPUs as well. So sort of looking at the, the performance of that. And also since, um, you know, one of the things that NPUs and a lot of things that a lot of the modern ML frameworks are doing is that they make trade-offs for performance versus accuracy, also trying to capture that sort of as in a metric as well. So that's something else that we've been working on, uh, but that's very laser focused on ML and uh, not necessarily has the same broad applicability that say the Geekbench suite has. So you can run those tests on the CPU or the GPU or the NPU, you can run on any of them and kind of get results for each subsystem to see how it runs. You can run the you can run the models. So we'll have um, about you know five or ten uh, five to ten different models that are available with different um, 
uh, accuracies, you know, we'll have, you know, uh, the sort of float 32 model, which is the highest accuracy usually. And then we'll go all the way down to an intake quantized model, which, you know, runs much faster, but with quantization comes necessarily lessened accuracy. So we'll let you run those models on whatever device uh, on your, sorry, whatever accelerators your device has, whether it's uh, just a CPU, which is sort of the fallback for most of these devices. Um, but most devices also have a GPU, if not an MPU as well. So, you know, we let you run the models on there, compare the performance also compare the accuracy so you can sort of see how the devices are making trade-offs. Um, this is what I said sort of, you know, when I said, you know, this is something that we're previewing right now. We're not sure how we necessarily want to stitch this together with Geekbench itself because, you know, the NPU ML is moving so quickly. How do we want to do these accuracy characteristics? Uh, but I know definitely a lot of people who, especially when they spend a lot of time dealing with ML and sort of looking at where the next generation of NPUs are going, uh, you know, this is sort of the benchmark for them. We're still looking at Geekbench as sort of the one that has wide applicability. And that sort of situations where we still think, um, especially on the desktop side, where it's not quite clear how, um, you know, we should be tapping into MPUs on that side, you know, still looking at sort of the traditional CPU performance of ML with the new instruction sets that are available, you know, VNNI on Intel, I8MM on ARM, um, or GPU acceleration, you know, using whether it's OpenCL, whether it's using uh, Vulkan, whether it's using Metal, um, those sorts of applications as well. We still think that's quite relevant, at least for now, until MPUs, uh, it still feels like with MPUs, there's a lot of unanswered questions as to how applications should leverage them, even on mobile, where they've been quite popular for a while. And that's cross-platform as well, that that, applet, that suite. Right now, Geekbench ML is uh, available for iOS and Android. Uh, we're hoping to do a release that includes desktop support uh, in the spring. Okay, please do tell me a bit about Geekbench 6. Sure. So Geekbench 6 um, is sort of the evolution of sort of Geekbench as what we're looking at, as I said, you know, really trying to develop a real world uh, benchmark that measures the performance of the CPU. And now, of course, you know, for the last couple of versions as well, the GPU, when it comes to sort of compute tasks, the, the sort of things that we say, you know, what are what are users using in their applications? Um, you know, uh, things like web browsers, photo applications, uh, whether it's, you know, organization, whether it's, you um, uh, filters that you might put on social media, uh, those sorts of things that people are doing day in, day out uh, with their applications. So with Geekbench 6, what we've done is we've really tried to, um, you know, further improve uh, the real world relevance of the uh, of the uh, benchmark. So uh, whether it's a case of, you know, uh, going through and sort of figuring out, you know, what people are doing with their computers today, hence the addition of workloads like background blur to sort of model the sorts of things that, you know, we saw over the pandemic. Um, yeah, other things like, uh, you know, how are people using M ML uh, to, you know, uh, organize their lives in a certain way, you know, the photo library workload that I mentioned earlier, where, you know, uh, applications will tag your photos automatically for you, so you don't have to do that. Um, and as I said, you know, as somebody with young children, it's helpful because there are some days where, you know, it feels like I've taken 100 pictures and I don't have time to sit down and, and sort through them. Um, other workloads that we've done as well um, are things like, uh, you know, uh, improving uh, the data sets that we're using. Uh, for some of the other workloads, you know, there are workloads that, you know, are evolutions of workloads that were in Geekbench 5, but now they're working on larger data sets, you know, and a really obvious example of that is in mobile devices. If you look at what a flagship phone had for a camera sensor in 2019, when Geekbench 5 came out versus 2023 today, you know, we're seeing some cameras with 48 megapixels, 108 megapixel cameras, you know, it's just been this explosion in image size. Uh, and applications have to deal with that. So, you know, we're trying to answer questions like, you know, how do applications, how do your, how does your processor, how does your phone deal with, you know, a 48 megapixel image that your camera might be generating? You might be taking every single time, you know, you take a picture. So, you know, trying to make the data sets bigger, trying to make the workload, the work that the workloads are doing are more relevant, more realistic. That was the big push for what we did in uh, Geekbench 6. One other thing that we did as well again, trying to look at the relevance is we've completely changed the way that we do threading uh, in Geekbench 6. So if, if you're not familiar with Geekbench 5, you know, we've always, we've split out the scores into a single core score and a multi-core score. In Geekbench 6, uh, we still have the same single core and multi-core score, but we've changed the way that we actually do the parallelism inside Geekbench to get that multi-core score. In Geekbench 5, what we do is we'd have, uh, we'd look at the number of cores on a system. So let's say you're on a smartphone and you've got eight cores. We'd launch eight separate tasks. Uh, and that's a great way to sort of measure sort of, you know, a best case scenario for multi-threading. You know, each core can kind of do its own thing. It doesn't have to communicate with the other cores. You know, it's kind of incumbent on the scheduler to move stuff around if, you know, one core is idle or something like that. But for the most part, the cores kind of left on their own. They complete the tasks. It's kind of the best case scenario for threading. And what we've done in Geekbench 
is we think that sort of models a little bit optimistic because applications as core counts increase more on the desktop than mobile, but as core counts increase, applications have to be rewritten and reworked to take advantage of those cores. And not all algorithms are going to be able to do that. Not all of your processes are going to be able to do that. Some things are still inherently single threaded. Some things you can parallelize a little bit. Some things you can parallelize a lot. So that's what we've tried to do with the new multi-core suite in Geekman 6 is split things out into those workloads where some of them parallelize really well, some of them you get a little bit of parallelism, some you just don't get much at all. Uh, and so instead of having that separate copy of a task on each of the cores, the cores instead all work on one shared task, uh, which we think is a much more representative way of, you know, if you've got a foreground application, you know, you're applying filters to a photo, you're trying to do that sort of stuff. Um, it's a much more realistic way because now the threads have to coordinate with one another. They have to communicate back and forth. And it really puts a lot more stress on the operating system, on the uh, CPU design to make sure the uh, communication between those cores is efficient uh, and that you know the cores are able to work together as quickly as possible to actually accomplish a task. Uh, so that was the other really big thing that we've done in Geekbench 6 to sort of improve the real world relevance of the workloads. So the scores between, let's say, Geekbench 5 and Geekbench 6 are not directly uh, comparable because they are different uh, benchmarks. However, when it comes to the point releases, let's say Geekbench 5, Geekbench 5.1, Geekbench 5.2, can you compare the results across these different point releases? Once we get, so usually with a, with what we've done in the past, you know, uh, 3.0 wasn't necessarily comparable with 3.1, 4.0 wasn't comparable with 4.1, because usually there's always, you know, as much as, you know, especially now, you know, we, we have a very large testing lab, so we're able to catch a lot of issues before the release, uh, but there is always going to be feedback that we're going to get uh, after we ship a benchmark and someone's going to point something out and we go, oops, that, that we, we, we made a mistake there, we should fix that. And we always try and do that in the first month or two. So, you know, uh, you know, 6.0 to 6.1, will it be comparable? It's hard to say. Um, but after that point, we really try and keep the benchmark comparable for the 6.1, 6.2, 6.3. Usually when we do a .2, a .3 release, it's sort of a, oh, we're adding support for new hardware. So if you're benchmarking that new hardware, you might want to just use the newer version. Otherwise, it's comparable to the older scores because those systems weren't out at the time that, you know, say .1 or .0 was out. So for the most part, it's comparable. Um, we try and call out explicitly where it is or isn't comparable in our release notes because that turns out to be a very common question that we get uh, just from our users. So you know, we're trying to be more proactive about making that clear. Well, John, thank you very much for your time. Is there anything else you'd like to add at the end now? Uh, what I'd say is that, you know, uh, we've worked the last three years on Geekbench 6. It's taken a little longer than we'd like, um, but, you know, uh, looking at just sort of you know, the uh, reaction we've had uh, with, you know, sort of the limited release that we've had with, you know, various hardware companies, um, you know, we're seeing people uh, in different organizations with competing interests say, oh, you know, we really like this benchmark. You know, we use Geekbench internally because we think it's a good measure of actual performance. Uh, so we're really pleased to see the direction of Geekbench 6. Um, so, you know, we're excited about this release. Uh, I think it's a great improvement over Geekbench 5, you know, uh, not to say Geekbench 5 was a terrible benchmark, um, but uh, Geekbench 6, I think, as I said, is a step in that evolution of trying to make it, you know, more relevant, more reworld. So I'm really pleased with it. The team here at Primate Labs is really pleased with it. And I'm actually really excited to see what people think of it when we release later this month. Well, I, I'm really quite excited to get hold of it and to, uh, to to give it a try and to see the kind of numbers it's coming up with uh, for the equipment I've already got and for new stuff that's coming. So I you've got one fan here, so I'm I'm all on Excellent. board. Okay, John, thank you very, very much. This has been an education and interesting and enlightening. Uh, all the, Wish you all the best of success with uh, Geekbench 6 and for the GPU stuff and for the ML, the ML stuff. I uh, really have all of my support. Uh, thank you for chatting me today. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, that's it. My name's Gary Sims for Authority Media. I really do hope you enjoyed this interview with John Paul. John, again, very much thanks for your time. Do check out the Authority Media YouTube page, as well as Android Authority, Sound Guys, and Gary Explains.